Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're here to talk about can packaging. The can. The aluminum can. So what we have is a lined aluminum vessel that is capable of being filled and sealed by the brewery. Uh, it's best choice for maximum quality for small scale packaging. So uh, small volume. This is pint can. Uh, in, in my opinion and the opinion of many others is the best choice. Uh, it was once associated with poor quality beer. Uh, you think of canned beer, you often think of mass-produced American ma uh, macro lager. And a long time ago, canned beer was of poor quality and that was because it had a metallic taste because there, the, the lining technology just wasn't there to prevent the beer from interacting with the aluminum. or steel can. At one point there were steel cans. Um, so the advantage of this particular vessel is it maintains pressure if your seal is appropriate and done well and it blocks all UV light. Uh, unlike glass where some UV light can come through even with a brown bottle, uh, there is no light getting through this package whatsoever. And it can chill very quickly. Aluminum is an amazing conductor of heat. Uh, you put, throw an aluminum can in some ice, ice water or some salt ice water if you want to get it really cold, it will chill very quickly. <clears throat> so the aluminum can itself is supplied as two pieces. We've got the can body itself, the can blank, and then the end here. Uh, they are actually supplied two separate pieces. Once the can body is filled, the end is put on top and seamed closed. Uh, once the, yeah, it's seamed, and the technology that uh, creates that seam is called double seam technology. So there's two seams that are uh, working in tandem to help prevent the beer from escaping and air from ingressing. So the cans themselves, they can range in size uh, significantly. If you can get the little 8 ounce stubby cans, uh, put whatever you want in there, all the way up to the 19.2 ounce, so the 1 pint, uh, 3.2 ounce, they're also known as stove pipes. Uh, they're the really tall cans. The can bodies and ends are supplied separately. Of course, the, the, end, the little ends, the caps, they come in sleeves that usually contain around 600 ends um, on your canner or whatever you have. They're usually fit into a tube to feed into the system. <clears throat> the most common can in is the 202. It's kind of a somewhat of a standard, becoming more and more standard. Um, there are cans, obviously, with different heights. There are also cans with different widths and diameters. And then, uh, Beyond those, we have Crowlers, which is a 32 ounce size, which is a very large double size, double pint, a quart, if you please. Uh, it's a to-go option that's similar to grass, glass growlers, uh, but it employs the idea of double seam technology. Uh, so you've got 32 ounce size. It's best if it's consumed fresh, and, that, and that's purely based on the method of filling. So you're filling these from your tap. You're surrounded by an oxygen environment. Uh, it is highly recommended to purge your crowler with CO2 beforehand, uh, either with an additional tap that just runs CO2 into your crowler, or you can create a little uh, blower with some compressed air parts from your local big box store and hook it up to your CO2 system post regulator uh, and run that purge your can a little bit. But if purged appropriately, it can last longer, significantly longer than a growler. Um, I'm not sure if I would really want it to last as long, potentially as a seamed smaller can like this from a, a system, but uh, it's possible. If you purge appropriately, if you fill uh, in, a, in a good manner and your growler seamer creates a double seam that doesn't fail. It can last significantly longer than a growler and possibly just as long as a smaller can as well. Uh, so the double seam, what, what's the idea behind the double seam? So you've got a lip on the can that is arched over and also a lip on your can lid that's arched over. And when those two get smashed together, they come up under each other 
and there are two seals created uh, with this. Uh, this connects the can end to the can body. So there are two operations by which it is the, that double seam is formed and then uh, smashed down on itself. The first operation rolls the end curl around the body flange, creating the basis for a good seam. As we'll go here, and this is the idea behind here. This is the uh, the black one is the can end, the gray one is the can body, and what the first operation does is it rolls that can end around that body flange. Flange. second operation smashes down uh, the basis of that first operation. Uh, it finishes that initial overlapping seam that we saw there and it creates a hermetic seal. It creates a pressure seal. It doesn't let anything out. doesn't let anything in. So we have to make sure that both steps of that process are done appropriately. So we need to verify. So verification of the correct specifications is very important. The most important step of this whole process is that first operation. If that first operation is not done appropriately, there is nothing you can do to that second seal to make or correct, make good on that first issue. Uh, there are no adjustments that can be made to a second operation if there is a first operation issue. So you want to make sure that your first operation is within normal limits, within all specified limits. And we see again here, uh, <clears throat> just an idea of what we're looking at. And we'll go in a little more depth here. Uh, we're covering the topic a little general at this point. So filling operations, the op options range from filling crawlers from the tap and seaming each can or crawler individually. Slow process because you're limited by how quickly you can move beer out of your tap into your can without creating excessive foam. Uh, and generally, uh, a lot of those aren't necessarily filled from the bottom. Filling from the bottom with like a, a growler tube probably would help uh, make the process a little gentler in general. Uh, but for the most part, most of the crawlers I've seen filled are just kind of you know, drop down into the crawler. Uh, you can get decent stability with that. Uh, but the same idea applies as you're filling a purge can with the appropriate amount of beer and seaming the can, all while preventing, trying to prevent the ingress of oxygen in the atmosphere that's surrounding. <clears throat> so, canning day and prep. Again, we've said this before, the first step is to verify your specs of your product being packaged. You need to have finished beer that is cold and carbonated before any of this happens. Uh, so you want to verify your temperature, you want to verify your carbonation, and you want to make sure that you verify your head pressure on your tank as you're starting to prep for canning day. Uh, most canning lines are going to want at least one atmosphere pressure, 14.7 or 15 psi if you round up, uh, or the maximum pressure that your vessel can handle. Definitely want to make sure that you're well above your uh, equilibrium pressure to make sure that none of that CO2 breaks out from a difference in pressure there. Second step is to prep your machine and to check your seams. Uh, so you want to make sure before you start everything, is your beer ready to go? If beer is ready to go, it passes all of your quality checks, all of your spec checks. Time to prepare your machine. And sometimes that can be involved depending on your machine. <clears throat> First thing you want to do is, depending on what, what your process steps are, you can either check your seams or start running your CIP. Uh, I always check my seams first. So you run a blank can full of water, run it through, do a first in operation. So one can will just get the first operation done on it. You'll set that to the side. Uh, it's generally recommended to pop it and drain it so you don't accidentally include it in your 
in your sellable product. And the second can is going to get both operations run on it. And we're going to check a number of things on these cans. Uh, first and second operation seam thickness, first and second countersink depth, uh, body and hook cover lengths, and in general you also you want to uh, tear down your seam, make sure it looks good, uh, and we'll cover that a little more uh, later on in some of the readings as well. Uh, you want to make sure that the measurements that you take are compared against the can specifications that come from your can manufacturer. If you are within uh, the specified measurements that your can spec sheet has, then you have the best chances at having a long-lasting product uh, in your can. <clears throat> and your canning line manufacturer is going to recommend that you record any and all measurements that you make. Uh, that way you can have a record of the measurements that you've made and start to track and see if anything begins to drift out of spec. Uh, there are some things I'm sure the manufacturer can tell you uh, how to prevent that or just how to keep it track and see if there's anything that needs to be adjusted on the machine based on those measurements. Again, we're looking at the double seam. Uh, so a little bit of nomenclature here. So A, seam length or seam height. So we're looking at here from the top of that to the very bottom of that. Uh, B we can see here is the seam thickness. That is obviously just the thickness of the seam itself. And C, we can see from at the very top here to the bottom of the little indenture inside of your can lid there. That is the countersink depth. Uh, and that gives us an idea of how tall your total seam is uh, in relation to what it should be, how you're squeezing. If you're squeezing too much, you're too tall. We've got D, the body hook. So this is the, the hook uh, of the body can, the can body itself here. And then E is the end hook, and that's the thing we can see here and here. That's the hook that goes up inside of uh, the body flange and the body hook. And F is the overlap, and that's the distance that you have that actual double seam there. So you've got cross right there and that's your that's your double seam and then uh, G is your seam gap um, not something that I can measure that's going to be things where you cut the can apart and use a, a computer to, to digitally look at your your seams <clears throat> so what we've got here is an example of a first operation seam uh, this will probably be a little easier to see on the PDF itself uh, but you can see here that seam it just doesn't look normal, uh, and that's because only the first operation has been run on that particular can. So what we've done there is we've just run the first op, and then we set it to the side, do whatever else we need to do with the second, uh, the second can, and then we measure everything we need to measure on this can. That's going to be the uh, seam thickness, the seam height, and the countersink depth. Uh, <clears throat> and you'll see here how different the first and second off, look. That is a finished seam. Uh, that you'll find on every can that's out there. That's what they uh, look like. That's what they want you to look like. Uh, that is not a complete seam that will leak. Oops. And that is a hermetic seal on an aluminum can. Thing of beauty. I look at cans very differently these days. <clears throat> I admire other companies' seams. And what we have here is the micrometer that is used to measure uh, the seam thickness and the seam height. And that's the side view of it and the top view. You can see that we're actually on a can measuring. Uh, we're measuring at this point the seam thickness. And it's probably be easier for if you go to somewhere to can, they'll show you how to use the micrometer. It's, Easier to show you in person where you can actually touch and interact with the micrometer than for me to just to tell you how to do it. <clears throat> That's kind of what it should look like as far as measuring your seam thickness. Um, sometimes you want it to be maybe a little less than perpendicular. It depends on your can and exactly how uh, you want to measure it. Sometimes you want about a, maybe a 30 degree angle. And this is 
measuring the counterseam depth with a, uh, a feeler gauge there. And that's measuring, uh, I don't have a picture of it again, uh, from the very top of that seam down into the little gully in the side of the can lid there. So we're back to canning day preps. We've done our, we've checked our seams, everything is in specifications, our beer is ready to go, we're ready to get our machine ready. Uh, so we're going to run a CIP and an SIP and per the protocols that your manufacturer has set down for your canning machine or any protocols that you have created for your machine. <coughs> you want to make sure that all of your connections to your machine are in place. Uh, that usually means you've got your compressed air, make sure that your compressor is turned on, make sure that your compressed air is connected and make sure that your gauges read the correct pressure that your machine requires. CO2, you want to make sure that you've got your connections made and ready to go when uh, canning line begins. Uh, got your power, of course, you're going to be plugged in, make sure everything's running appropriately. And water, if you have a rinse anywhere, post-rinse, pre-rinse, you want to make sure that you've got your water set up and ready and ready to go and on. You want to make sure that there are enough cans and enough ends. You probably want to make sure that you have enough of that stuff before you go through all this. You don't want to get started and realize, like, I don't have enough can ends to, to do this. Uh, you either have to cancel your canning run and order some more can ends, or just run until you run out, or call someone and borrow some, see if you, uh, any other brewery around has the same ends as you. <clears throat> On the flip side of that, you want to make sure that once you've got your product packaged, that you have enough labels. Uh, and that is something that maybe you could do down the line. You can run your product, and if you don't have enough labels, maybe you can wait until you have labels afterwards. Uh, the only problem with that is if your product's selling, you're not going to be able to sell unlabeled product. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have labels beforehand. Uh, and then make sure that you have enough packing materials, whether that be your pack techs, uh, your cardboard flats, your any kind of other holders that you may have. Uh, and make sure that you're just prepped and ready to go. Every, all of your cardboard flats are folded and ready uh, for enough of what you're going to be canning that day. Any prep work you can do the day before in any of this is going to make a huge time difference on canning day. Is something as little as making sure that your cardboard flats are all folded and ready to go it can make a huge dent in the, the total day, total hours on your, on your canning run. <clears throat> you want to verify your minimum weight goal of cans before uh, product being canned. So what, what are we doing there? We are making sure that we have the minimum stated volume in this can. So the volume that we are stating in here it is one pint in this particular can, 473 milliliters. That weight, uh, you want to check, uh, you want to make sure that you have enough liquid in here. So you want to have your goals for weights set and known by everybody running cans that day or going to be weighing cans to make sure that you have uh, sellable product, basically. If everybody knows what the minimum weight for the day is, everybody can change out, switch around, and make sure that we have a uh, sellable product. And you want to designate an area for packaging rejects, low fills, dented cans that are just way too dented to sell, uh, anything like that, because you don't want to be pulling low fills and putting them in an area that is too close to finished product where they actually get mixed in. Don't want to have any issues as far as that goes. So you want to make sure you have an area designated for low fills that are not going to be labeled into sellable product. <laughs> Canning run. So your cans are going to come on a pallet. So you have to get them from the pallet onto or into your machine. Uh, so that means they have to be depalletized. So that could be as intensive as a person manually removing these cans from the pallet onto a prep table or as sophisticated as a pallet being inserted into a mechanical depalletizer and you're pushing a button and then it takes care of everything itself. Uh, 
so that particular process, they're gonna that machine's gonna raise it up, and the machine's gonna push those cans into a hopper, basically, and it's gonna feed them into the conveyor belt and insert them into your canning line yourself. Uh, dented cans on the sides, they can be used. You might want to try to you know uh, purse out those dents a little bit, but you want to look at the very top of your can. If that lip is damaged in any way whatsoever, that becomes recycling fodder. Uh, you don't want to use a can where this lip is damaged in any manner because that is going to lead to uh, false seams or issues with your seam. And that's just going to be wasted product and hurt reputation. If you've got a, a can on the shelf and it's slowly leaking out, that's not good. That's a wasted can, that's a wasted sale, and also looks very poorly, reflects very poorly upon the brewery. If your can is dented, I would draw a line at some point. I mean, you don't want your can, you know, to look like a beat up box, basically. Uh, if it's got a little purse on the side, that's going to be covered with a label. If you can push it out, it's going to be just fine, and within reason. And you'll figure out exactly what you feel comfortable with selling uh, here at the shoulder and down here at the very bottom. Those are going to be the ones that really show. Uh, anything in the middle here, you'll be able to, to purse it out uh, and whatever's left is going to get covered with a label anyway. <clears throat> and the cans, unless you are getting your cans directly from the manufacturer, which, if you do get them directly from, let's say you're using Ball, if you get them directly from Ball, and you take them straight from their pallet and into your depalletizer and just run in, you may not necessarily have to rinse because those cans are going to be clean and sterilized, and for the most part, prevented by the dunnage in between from anything getting into the can. Now, if you buy them from a third-party repackager, that is either going to be printing your can, or sleeving them, or just tearing down from a, the, the pallet into a partial pallet, uh, you're going to want to rinse your cans. There's a possibility that something may have gotten into that can at some point during that process. Uh, so you're going to want to rinse. Uh, that's the last chance to guarantee that there is no foreign material inside of your cans. Uh, it can be as labor intensive as a person physically putting the can inside of a little rinse station and it rinse, the, the machine sprays it or uh, whatever you have there, you can do a foot pedal and open up a valve to spray. Uh, I would at least have that water be carbon filtered, that way you're not introducing any chlorine. Or it can be as sophisticated with uh, the depalletizer. You can run your cans through a twist rinse where it just, everything's done automatically. And then the cans get to the point where they're lined up under the filler head. Once you have your machine dialed in, it takes a little while for the beer coming from your bright tank, unit tank, or fermenter, wherever you're canning from, those hoses have to cool down. Uh, the product in those hoses uh, is going to cool down those hoses. <clears throat> but in the process of that, you're going to have breakout. So typically, the, the filling heads, they're going to run, they're going to purge, they're going to run for a little while to waste. I mean, you're going to waste some beer. It's a horrible thing, and it sucks, but it's part of the process. Uh, you need to plan for it, and just be ready for it. <clears throat> Anytime you have anything semi-automatic like this. Now, if you're kind of hand-filling, probably not going to waste nearly as much beer, but you're going to spend a lot more time doing it. Uh, so, once you're, you're all dialed in, you're getting to the point where your, your hoses are, are cool, you're ready to go, your cans are starting to line up under your fill head, that's where your machine really starts taking over and, and filling. So the basic lines are going to fill by timing, and uh, your operator is going to have to kind of fine-tune the, the resistance to get a fill level that will get you above your minimum weight. Uh, and that's where uh, training, familiarity with your your filling line comes into play. Uh, very sophisticated ones are going to basically fill by sensors uh, and as they get calibrated and go you're going to have less and less waste. Uh, same thing with the, the 
the less sophisticated ones. Once you get familiar with your machine, you know how long you need to run your purge to make sure that your lines are cooled down and exactly where you need to be on your resistance. It's, it's feathering, it's fine-tuned, it's, it's experience. Uh, waste, is, waste can be significant at first. One of our first canning runs, we had four and a half cases of low fills. Uh, that hurts. Four and a half cases of low fills, that's, that's a kick in the stomach. That's product that should have been sold, but can't be sold. And then it becomes employee drinkers. <coughs> So, you're all set, you're, you're, you're lined up, you're, you're zoned in, your machine is calibrated, you're getting, you're getting fills that are appropriate. The machine pushes them on, in that process it's going to pick up a can end. Your can end is going to be dispensed from a chute and put on top of your can body, and the machine is going to push it towards the seamer. And as that picks up an end, Ideally, you'd want to see some foam on top there. Uh, that beer foam is going to help prevent oxygen ingress and prevent staling, a premature staling of your beer. Uh, the lower you can have oxygen ingress, the better your package is going to be. Uh, it's inevitable that some oxygen is going to go in there. there there's a certain level, uh, and we measure oxygen in parts per billion at that point. If you can afford the tools uh, that measure that, uh, and they are not cheap by any means. So uh, we go off of faith that our manufacturer of our canning line has provided us a fantastic machine that they have designed to reduce dissolved oxygen pickup as much, as much as possible, and we rely upon sensory evaluation. Uh, we torture cans uh, from each run just to see if we have any issues with oxidation or staling, uh, and so far I think we're doing really well. It would be easier if we had that very expensive machine to test, uh, and that would be another actionable item that we could, we could move things around on our candy line just to adjust and, and see if we can reduce our oxygen pickup. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that, it's just not a reality to be able to afford something like that. Uh, so, we're, we're capping on foam, we're getting seamed, and usually uh, your machine's probably going to rinse to remove any excess beer before you get to an inline labeler, if you can afford that, or before they're spit out of the machine uh, onto an accumulation table of some sort. Uh, if your cans are not printed or sleeved, they're going to come out looking just like this, and then you're going to have to label them. Uh, at that point, uh, you can either pair up an inline labeler or uh, have a collection table, an accumulation table there, and then a person taking them from that table to a labeler. Uh, at that point, cans are manually packaged from a collection table on basic lines, so you've got a person there watching your collection table labeling uh, and putting them into uh, four packs and putting them into case trays. Or, uh, if you have enough money, you've got a line that does all that for you and out spits out uh, fully packaged 12 packs, 6 packs, or cases at some point. Uh, if you have the, the plastic pack tech holders, you can get them in a 2, 4, or 6 pack holders. Uh, like I said, sophisticated canning lines are going to spit those cans into a, a next step of packaging where it puts it into all of the cardboard packaging and everything. And then your packages are ready to be sold or stored. Uh, one thing I didn't cover here is date coating. Uh, date coding basically just tells you at which point or at on which day these cans were packed. And it can be as simple as what we do. We put them a four pack on the pack tech and then we use a uh, pricing sticker to put the date on top of that four pack. So that four pack is dated with its package date. Because <clears throat> the inline printers, or you print the little date codes on the bottom or on the neck or something like that, they're pricey. Maybe eventually, but right now, a pricing gun, pricing sticker gun is significantly cheaper. So, issues. Canning run issues. Uh, I, I may have said it before, but the fact that breweries are able to uh, correctly package and seam these products is, is amazing. Uh, it, it's difficult. 
one of the main issues that we see uh, on canning day is low fills. Uh, cans that are underfilled and cannot be sold. Uh, the government's going to say that you have to have at least the stated volume on your package. If you say that this can is 16 fluid ounces, it better contain at least 16 fluid ounces. Uh, so, ways that we can help prevent low fills. Verify that your tank head pressure is appropriate. And that is an ongoing thing. Uh, during your canning process, you have to make sure that the head pressure on your tank is maintained throughout the whole process. Uh, and that can be as basic as checking the pressure on your tank visually and making turning up your regulator if your head pressure starts to drop below what you need it to be. Or they also make little devices that will monitor and adjust your headspace uh, for your canning days. Uh, they're expensive. But the question is, will it help save low fills and money in the long run? And that honestly depends on how much of an issue you're having, uh, how much labor you have, how close your tank is to your filling line, uh, a number of variables that you know just need to be looked at to see if you can afford or justify the cost of something like that. Uh, you want to make sure that your CO2 source isn't frozen. Uh, we've noticed in the winter time when we're canning, we don't have a vaporizer on our bulk tank, so it pulling that much CO2 volume out of that bulk tank phase change from the liquid that's stored in that tank to the gas that's needed to push all that stuff drops the temperature around all of the, the gauges and, and all that stuff that's on top of that tank and you can freeze your CO2 tank up especially when it's cold outside there's not enough ambient heat to assist in that phase change and you can freeze up your, your CO2 source uh, having a vaporizer on your bulk tank will help alleviate that problem and make sure that you can supply the CO2 in the volume and the pressure that you need to run your canning line. In the summertime, we've, we've not had any issue. It's hot enough outside, we don't really have freezing up of our, of our bulk tank. But uh, January and February, it was a real issue. We, could, we couldn't run as much as we wanted to because the, the pressure would drop significantly. We'd have problems keeping up head pressure on our tank. We'd have problems purging our cans. We'd have problems with our CO2 blanket that occurs uh, before cane lid pickup. And you can just hear it as when that, that valve's open on the purge, you can hear the flow drop significantly. <clears throat> uh, verify that your compressed air pressure feeding machine is appropriate. Uh, we had an issue one time where somehow we, we kicked the breaker on our air compressor. I don't know what happened. It's never happened since. It never happened before. We had one day where... All of a sudden, things just weren't working, working right. Things were moving slower. The fill head wasn't closing or opening in an appropriate time. So I shut everything down, and I looked at the pressure gauge on our compressed air, and it was sitting at 48 PSI. We should be at 100. So our air compressor didn't keep up because we kicked the breaker on it. Uh, so verify that your compressed air is in an appropriate uh, pressure and flow. And sometimes you just got to adjust the flow of things. It's a very dynamic situation. Sometimes you just have to keep an eye on it and adjust your flow restriction if you have the ability to do that. Uh, high fills, they are cans that are overfilled than what is stated on the can. Uh, the cost associated with, associated with that is you're giving away free beer. Uh, you're, you're selling a, a can that's supposed to have 16 fluid ounces to the customer for a certain price. If it has 16 and a half fluid ounces and every single one of your cans has that, that adds up to an appreciable loss of beer. <clears throat> so you want to try to dial in your fills to prevent overfills as much as possible and prevent any and all low fills at all. Because you cannot sell a low fill. All right, so we're filling up, and we've got an appropriate fill level in the can, but we've got flat liquid on top. We've got just liquid, no foam whatsoever. We know the beer is carbonated because we checked it, right? First thing you want to do is make sure that the beer is not uh, undercarbonated. If you should have verified that already, then we know that's not an issue. 
the other issue is the beer is too cold. Uh, you don't have that breakout. That is necessary a little bit when you're filling that can to cause that uh, foam cap. So you have a couple options there. You can run your beer a little faster into your fill, adjust everything, adjust your timing, adjust your restriction to where you get a little more mechanical agitation to cause that breakout, to cause that foam. Because at this point it's probably a little too late to adjust temperature. You're in the middle of a run, if you adjust temperature, it, there's no way it's going to adjust upwards at this point. It's just, the only thing you can do is adjust your flow. That way you're getting a little more agitation and, and knock a little bit of CO2 out and cause that foam cap. Seams leaking. If you've got cans coming off your line that has beer coming out, you squeeze it and you can force liquid out of your seam. Stop. You're done. You need to do some maintenance on your machine. You need to take a look, see what's going on. You're done. You don't have a, You don't have sellable product. You can't do anything. Uh, machines running slower than usual, check your compressed air. Something, something's going on there. Uh, that or you're having a brownout, you don't have enough electricity to run everything that you need. That's going to be probably pretty rare. Uh, but, more than likely, it's an issue with your compressed air pressure. Uh, your DO or your TPO, your dissolved oxygen and total package oxygen is above acceptable limits. Uh, this would be something uh, that is actionable if and only if you are testing dissolved oxygen on the fly. If you've got someone that's got a machine and you're pulling cans off your line and you're checking it and you're way high, probably would take a break, see what's going on. Maybe your CO2 is not flowing right. Uh, maybe you're not getting enough breakout to get that foam cap. Uh, maybe you just have flawed product to start. But uh, if you've got stuff, if you're taking these measurements and they are out of spec while you're doing a canning run, it's time to pause and see what you can adjust to see if you can fix that. Breakout issues. That's foaming. So usually this can be uh, indirectly, or well, you can see it. If you're the operator, you're looking, you're seeing you got a lot of foam coming out of your can. But if you're getting a lot of low fills, you're having breakout issues because that beer that's going in is just making foam immediately and coming out the top. And then you're going to end up with maybe this much liquid in your can and that much foam. Uh, so excessive foaming causes low fills and you can also have some lid pickup issues. It doesn't really allow the lid to sit down on your can. Pushes the lid off, doesn't allow it to seat correctly. Uh, verify your head pressure and your tank temperature. Head pressure, if it starts dropping, you're going to get breakout issues. Uh, your temperature, probably likely not going to be an issue here uh, unless you started way too high to start. Uh, then I'd probably just stop and let the tank catch up. Uh, maybe run tomorrow or something. Uh, you're going to check for kinks in your beverage line. If your beverage line isn't a large insulated hose, if it is a smaller silicone hose that is leading into your machine, it's possible it could have gotten kinked. You want to make sure that you uh, keep it from getting curled around anything or, or pressed between two pieces of metal or anything like that. And you, if you have breakout in your line, if part of your line is somewhat see-through, you can see that you're having breakout, purge that line. You're going to waste less product in the long run by purging your line and just letting beer flow through it to purge any air pockets that may have uh, developed throughout the process. And if you would just keep running, think you're going to push it out by running cans, you're just, you're wasting aluminum, you're wasting beer. It's cheaper just to waste beer by purging your lines to get rid of any potential uh, bubbles that may have formed or air pockets that may have formed. Uh, if you have a delay in the line or a crunch or something a can has gotten damaged on the line. <clears throat> Automated lines rely on a constant supply of cans, so care must be taken to make sure that there are no um, stoppage or no slowing down of, uh, of the required cans. Uh, it can really throw things off with, a, with an automatic line. Uh, replacing a spool of labels, if, you're, if your labels have run to the end, you want to get to the point where you can do that as quickly as possible if you have an inline labeler if you don't have an accumulation table in between uh, your exit of your canning line and your uh, inline, inline label. Uh, crunched cans, you got it manually. You can either have to hit the emergency stop or if you're able to reach in, I don't recommend it. You're going to pinch yourself possibly. Uh, you want to stop your line, remove crunch lines, reset everything and get it going again. Uh, it's a pain in the butt, but you know sometimes it happens. 
exploding cans. I don't know how many times I'm, we're going to talk about this throughout throughout this class and the previous class, but it's a rampant issue with hyperfruited sour breweries. Uh, again, not acceptable. Uh, it's extreme potential liability, and the breweries should be held accountable. And the problem with that is the customers really aren't holding them accountable. The customers are still buying the product, uh, knowing that the potential exists. So. I don't know of any other way that the breweries can be held accountable other than somehow regulators are going to probably get involved, you know, and that's not good for any of us. The more we're regulated, the more headaches it causes. All right, thank you.